Uh, I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, so we're a nonprofit advocating for fast, frequent, and affordable trains across the country. Um, we're supported by our members, people like you, who uh, wish that they could ride the train when they travel or have the kind of walkable, dynamic, um, prosperous city or town that happens when you can take the train. Um, so thank you for joining us. A little quick overview of who we are. Uh, for those uh, who haven't been with us before, uh, we strive to be the most knowledgeable, independent source of what high-speed rail is, uh, why we should build it in this country, and what steps local leaders um, can take to help make it happen. Um, we educate folks at the local level um, on those things. And then we help uh, you and all their local leaders educate the leaders in state capitals um, and in Washington, DC. Um, we believe in what we call the integrated network approach where uh, different types of track, uh, including shared use track where um, Frequent passenger trains are operating at speeds at 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour um, with heavy freight trains um, combined with uh, lines called, we call regional lines where you focus on passenger trains coming into the city or maybe out into rural areas where a line is available. And then high speed lines, which take about 20% of the network, but bring the juice to the party um, where you're building new high-speed track in segments of 150 to 200 miles in places in the network that really impacts entire regions. And in some cases, the trains travel on all kinds of track. And in some cases, you've got uh, strong connections. So what that means is, uh, on the one hand, these, in these important investments are impacting entire regions, not just major cities. And on the other hand, you're bringing a lot more people to the system, so it makes it easier to finance and justify those expensive investments. So part of this network, if you can see in our sample diagram, is airports. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit more about how high-speed trains and um, airlines can interact to make each other uh, healthier and stronger. Um, and I will introduce uh, Chris Ott, our Deputy Director up in Madison, um, in order to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you all for being here. And it's a real pleasure to be introducing Mike Schlichting as our guest speaker today. I feel like in some ways this talk uh, has its roots in a conversation that uh, Mike and I had on a nice day in July last summer. Um, that was where we met and, and Mike started telling me about uh, this interesting work that he's been doing about the interplay between high-speed rail and uh, the airline industry. Uh, Mike is an instructor uh, in the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Business. Uh, he is a PhD candidate studying high-speed rail and the effect that it can have on cities in the future. And he is the president of a student organization called the Wisconsin High-Speed Transportation Group. And so with that basic introduction, uh, Mike, please take it away. All right, well, thanks, Rick. Thank, uh, thanks, Chris, for this opportunity to present here. Um, so let me just share my screen here and uh, let's get started talking about this relationship between airlines and high-speed rail. Uh, traditionally, we think of them as competitors. It's in the media a lot, but I'm hoping the one thing you take away from today is that they actually complement each other. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about this in the frame of what's called the tale of two seats, if you notice it's a play on the tale of two cities. Um, so let's get started. So let's start off with, when you look at, you know, all, all those of us who love airplanes or love high-speed rail, we'd see air, airplane seats and uh, high-speed rail seats as totally separate. Um, but the difference is when you're a passenger, we tend to, all they care about as passengers really, are we gonna move safely, efficiently, and cheaper between the cities? Um, so while we might look at these separate, the truth is in the passenger's eyes, they're exactly the same. Now, why do we think of them as different? Um, do they not perform the same function? Well, in a lot of ways, and we're gonna get into detail about this over the next uh, 35 or 40 minutes, 
Um, but we've been trained to think that rail and airlines and airplanes are competitors. But I actually ask you, if they work together, are they? So my name is Mike Schlichting. Uh, as uh, Chris uh, mentioned, I grew up actually in Chicagoland. Uh, what's really funny about my history is my grandmother worked for United Airlines, my mother worked for United Airlines, and even I did my undergrad to be in aviation management, going to work for United Airlines, uh, both in customer service and airline operations at the airport. Uh, but then I moved over to headquarters where I worked everywhere from flight safety to um, the cargo division where I had the incredible experience of putting in a pricing system where we had to travel, our team had to travel to every country United Airlines serves. And on one of those journeys is when I had the first experience of the Shikansen uh, between Tokyo and Osaka, uh, which really was life-changing and made me fall in love with high-speed rail. Um, I did leave United Airlines to pursue an MBA up in Madison, um, but uh, came up with this project of looking at high-speed rail from the airline's perspective of why the companies would be interested in partnering with a high-speed rail network which turned into another master's, a PhD, and where today I'm an instructor, both in real estate department with Wisconsin School of Business, uh, and then teaching also engineers and engineering professional development, um, as well as my shout out to the School of Human Ecology uh, that has allowed me to create my own degree up in Madison. So uh, again, my name is Mike Schlichting, and thank you for this opportunity. Now let's jump into the past. How did we get here? Why is there's belief that rail and airlines are two separate networks that they compete with each other? Well, I would actually, a lot of it goes back to the golden age of the railroads uh, back in the 30s, 40s and 50s when taking the, the 20th century limited from New York to Chicago was the ultimate in, uh, in travel and prestige. Uh, even um, going to LA or San Francisco, it was standard that you ride on the trains. But with the case of most technologies, you know, if you look today with landlines, telephones in the house or rotary phones, um, another more productive form of, transport of, of technology emerges. And that's where we had the development of the jetliner that changed um, how we travel. But I actually ask you this, was this really the end of passenger travel? Or did just the role of rail change? That's what the discussion is really about today. Um, now, along those lines, we've also had a history, uh, the most prolific being the case of Southwest Airlines killing the Texas TGV project back in 1994. Um, if you're not familiar with this project, it was a, a situation today where the federal government was giving the states a tremendous amount of money to help develop high-speed rail networks. Texas, uh, jumped on board and created the Texas High Speed Rail Commission and gave a franchise to, um, SN, to the operators of the TGV to build uh, a route from San Antonio up to Dallas and down to Houston. Um, at the same time, there was this little airline called Southwest. Um, now those are, you know, the history of Southwest, uh, they, were, they just started 20 years ago, 20 years before this in 1971, just flying three little airplanes between Dallas to Houston and down to San Antonio. The same triangle that the Texas TGV was built was uh, uh, attempting to build their high-speed rail line in. Um, as you can see by this route system, back then, Southwest Airlines was a very different airline than we know today. And as a result, this project for building the Texas TGV really hit at the exact heart of Southwest. And as a result, Southwest Airlines sued to stop the project. Now, uh, what actually happened was Southwest was not successful in litigation against the project. What actually occurred was uh, they just ran the Texas TGV out of money and investors were not willing to put in. So it's literally just a case of running out the clock. Um, now, um, that's a case in the 1990s. Now, Southwest Airlines, in this case, is a very different company today. In fact, they've had multiple uh, been asked multiple times about what they think about the Texas Central project. And in each case, they go, we're a very different company. Uh, we're you know, wishing them the best, but we're standing out of the way. Um, so that's where in history, we kind of think that it's contentious between the two, um, but it's just specific circumstances. In fact, if you go back to history, airline and railroad partnerships go back to the start of the, rail, of the airline industry. Even going back to 1928, the very first transcontinental airline service, at the time, no planes could barely even fly like 300 miles. 
Um, so a small little outfit called Transcontinental Air Transport partnered with the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Atchison Topeka um, to fly during the day and train at night. And that became the first Transcontinental Air, air Service. Uh, TAT, as it was known, uh, then became TWA uh, and eventually merged with American Airlines in 2001. So you could literally still go back to the start of the airline industry um, and have this connection with rail. Uh, more importantly, up in Canada, you had Canadian Pacific Railways that started an airline called Canadian Pacific uh, Air, uh, which eventually became Canadian International and merged with Air Canada in the early 2000s. Uh, even in the United States, Boston and Main Railroad started an airline called Northeast, which became a predecessor company of the Delta Airlines we know today. So there's always been this relationship between rail and the airlines. Uh, it's just kind of the case that we kind of still think of it today as competitors. Um, in fact, um, here's an example of United's Airline Route Network from just a few years ago. And first of all, you can see the breadth that uh, the airlines are as far as networks. And that, um, that's going to be something I emphasize throughout the presentation here, that airlines are networks, not just operators of airplanes. Um, but particular attention uh, I want you to look at is in the lower right corner, where for over 20 years, there was a relationship, a code share agreement between Amtrak and the United Airlines. It started with Continental, um, then when Continental and United merged in, in 2008, um, the, uh, the relationship continued. So um, the only problem was in 2020, it's uh, not much detail about it, but it's rumored that Amtrak discontinued the relationship uh, due to responsibility of who was uh, to pay for uh, um, misconnected passengers. Uh, but for over 20 years, there's always this relationship between the airlines and Amtrak that even existed. So let's talk about what's actually going on today, because there's some really, really exciting things that are going on in rail. Nothing formalized as far as high-speed rail, but that's, I'm sure that that's where it's going. But let's look at uh, a few of the things going on today. I spent a lot of time in myself in Denver, and I've watched the development of the A-Line, the commuter rail line from uh, downtown Denver out to the airport, which I, to me has been highly successful. But it's also a case that you also see uh, replicated throughout the nation. Um, you know, anybody who's been to D Reagan National Airport uh, knows the convenience and Dulles is building their silver line out to the airport. So there is this emphasis of connecting rail to use to get to the city center going on. But what I'm really excited about is what you see in Orlando with their South Terminal Complex. This is scheduled to open in 2022 or early 2023. Um, but to me, this is really, really an undervalued asset because it'll be the Brightline station where Brightline with their trains extending down to Miami, Fort Lauderdale and Palm Springs um, will be a in the same direct line as saying Spirit flying between Orlando and Fort Lauderdale or American Airlines flying from Miami to Orlando. And uh, I'm really excited to see I would uh, where this goes. Specifically, I would not be surprised if you see in the year 2023 or 2024 an announcement where the two airlines and bright lines start working together to move the passengers seamlessly um, between that, that network. Because as long as American Airlines can uh, offer ticket, buy, sell tickets um, on bright line, they're good with it. They don't necessarily want to fly these airplanes because they look at themselves as networks. So very excited about that project. Um, then of course, looking international, anybody who's been to Paris, Frankfurt, Brussels, or Amsterdam, know the experience of just walking out of customs migration and there being a high-speed rail station. Um, but the one I love to cite as the, the, the quintessential uh, apex of what could be is Hongqiao Airport in Shanghai. Um, if you fly into Shanghai, you probably most likely ended up at the newer airport, uh, Pudong, that was built in 1999. But the older airport, um, they might see the pictures of like Richard Nixon opening up China uh, back in 1960s. This is uh, Hongqiao. So in 2020, 2010, um, they redeveloped the whole airport and built a whole new terminal with a high-speed rail station. And I would actually argue it is so large that it's actually the case where it's a high-speed rail station with an airport connected. Uh, in fact, it's so large that it, you can actually take the subway um, underneath at two different subway stops. You can board the subway uh, near the airline check-in counters and actually ride it all the way to the next stop uh, down by the intermodal center in this terminal. It is so huge. And this is where, if you were to ask me what the future airport looks like, this is where I see it going once we finally build uh, these high-speed rail networks in the United States. 
So next step is let's talk about not only why the airlines want high-speed rail, but why they need high-speed rail. And there's uh, many, many different reasons from economic to say, to uh, to factors facing the industry today. Um, but if you look at the media, um, there's always, they always look, the media always looks to have this contention between the two. They'll say once high-speed rail comes to a market, it takes away that whole market from the, the airlines. So it's no wonder that the airlines feel threatened when they see these announcements and then the public sees it and says the same thing. But if you look at a lot of the routes, first of all, doesn't necessarily always take away the, the, the airline's own traffic. If you look at the Eurostar example, uh, back in the 1990s, it was said that it would take away all the air traffic, but there's a still a significant amount of air traffic between um, London to Paris. Um, Alitalia, for example, was cited based upon uh, the Italian high-speed rail, but Alitalia had its own problems. Uh, but so there's this negative connotation that they are competitors, but the truth is they actually could be very, very strong partners um, and complement each other. And so uh, I'm going to talk about how we do this through reducing costs, uh, shorten travel time. And then I'm going to dive into the two main subjects that are really affecting the airline industry today, which is pilot shortage and sustainability, aka flight shaming. So uh, let's dive in here. Um, so when you look at the profile of what a typical airline flight is like, airliners from Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, um, they're all designed to be a, to fly efficiently at high and fast, uh, meaning above 20,000 feet and flying more than 400, 500 miles per hour. Uh, the problem is to get up there, they waste a heck of a lot of fuel. And typically when a plane takes off from O'Hare, for example, you're looking at about 200, 300 miles that these airplanes are burning a lot of fuel to get up to that efficient uh, altitude um, so that they can operate. Um, this is actually why you see in the airline industry over the last 30 years literally outsource these flights. They lose money on these short flights. Um, so they've actually outsourced it to smaller carriers, uh, regional carriers that use the use of the brand's franchise, uh, such as United, um, to operate. So it using so outsourcing these short routes is nothing new to the airline industry. Um, the great news is the same routes that these long, the Boeing 737 is on, and 777 are unproductive are the sweet spot for high-speed rail. Those routes that are under 400 miles. Um, so that's where we're starting off with this, uh, where they actually could complement each other. But let's dive into uh, a specific mission. For example, so back on Wednesday, I pulled out this flight from Chicago to Los Angeles. It was just a general flight. Uh, thought about it. It's a Boeing 737-800, which is the most popular uh, commercial airliner out there. And when you look at the profile, uh, you can see that there, the flight itself just spent 20% of its flight below 20,000 feet. So uh, the airline made it up high, stayed up there. It's where it's most profitable um, and moving the fastest. Um, so that's where airlines work for these long distance flights. But now let's look at another example here. The same day, Chicago to Madison, a Boeing 737-800, same type of airplane, um, did the same, did its mission up to Madison. But when you look at it, it spent a total of two minutes at 20,000 feet, didn't even make it higher. And 92% of the flight was spent below uh, 20,000 feet going low and slow. This was an extremely expensive air flight for United Airlines to operate. Um, that's why the, the airlines don't really want to fly these short routes. But the reason they do fly these short routes is because of the fee. And even example here, the United feeds everybody in the Chicago hub, and then everybody collects everybody going to Madison for that night, and then flies at 737 up to Madison uh, for those passengers at the final destination, and the 737 will do the reverse back in the morning. It's literally these short flights are just to collect passengers for the airlines to bring to the hub um, so that the airlines can make a profit on those longer distance flights. And that's why um, you see that the airlines outsource these regional flights to routes. They don't want to fly them. They don't make a profit on them. Um, they just need to in order to collect all the passengers. But let's talk about from the passenger's um, side experience. So um, rarely does anybody buy a ticket from Madison to Chicago. Usually it's Madison, Chicago, New York, Madison, Chicago, San Francisco, or Madison, Chicago, Shanghai. 
it's all to collect. But if you really look at that flight, um, it's kind of crazy. From the time you enter that terminal to the time you leave the terminal, you're talking about, I estimate about two hours and 20 minutes. That means your average uh, movement through the system is only 40 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour uh, to get from Madison to Chicago uh, when you look at it from a time perspective. So it is extremely, extremely inefficient uh, way, for, in for, way of uh, transportation. Now compare that to the Takedo Shikansen, uh, going between Osaka and Nagoya, it's about a similar mileage. And from the time you enter the station there to the time you depart the station, you're looking at a travel time that is less than half you would spend on a similar route in the United States. And that's just incredible. Um, that's what gets me excited about what the high speed rail networks could look like here in the United States if we do, if we adopt the same technology. Um, so the next question that comes up is, well, would the airlines be willing to partner with high speed rail um, companies? Um, the answer is yes. In fact, I've already talked about regional carriers, how there's a partnership where they outsource United, the American, the Deltas have outsourced to regional carriers to fly the routes. But on the flip side, you have an initial a huge impact with global alliances, um, where you can buy a ticket on American Airlines to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Does American fly? No, it's because they've aligned through partnerships, the ability of American Airlines to sell you an airline ticket on Malaysian Airlines that take you to the final destination. So that's where these global alliances are so, so pop, uh, powerful. Um, but along the lines, I told you I'm uh, frequently out in Colorado and about a year and a half ago, I saw something called landlines uh, uh, join the United Airlines realm where actually it's a coach bus, but it is, totally integrated into the United Airlines system where you actually leave, you arrive off your flight in Denver, you literally just walk to another gate and board a bus in concourse A. Uh, you don't have to go to the main terminal. It's seamlessly integrated with the United experience. And in fact, uh, it's expanded to Bre uh, Breckenridge and I think in California, but I also know there's a landlines also been in, in Minneapolis working with airlines there. Um, so we're already seeing the network out there the only thing we're missing is a high-speed rail system for the airlines to partner with the United States. Now, that brings up the question of, well, what's the incentive for a high-speed rail um, company to partner with the airlines? Well, I'd like to uh, bring up two more examples here, which is loyalty. Uh, the loyalty programs of the airline are incredibly powerful. Along the same lines, you have the credit cards that actually um, give the airline buy huge amount of airline tickets every year. So they become huge, huge, powerfully powerful marketing uh, programs that really power the industry. In fact, um, sidebar, back when the pandemic hit, this blew my mind, American Airlines used its credit card relationships as loyalty program to, uh, to get a, as collateral for a $4 billion loan, I, I believe it was, four or $6 billion loan uh, to make it through the pandemic. So these loyalty programs are so, so powerful and we're partnering with the airline, uh, a high-speed rail company will be able to tap into that. Along the same lines is a premium customers and premium services that the airlines serve. That might not be recognized by a high-speed rail corporation uh, because the, the, the business traveler is just using them for a short leg, uh, but the airlines know who they are. And by partnering, um, the airlines will actually, the high-speed rail companies will actually have access to all the premium services um, that the, the airlines operate. It, no cost to the high-speed rail company. Uh, but more importantly, let's talk about the exist the partnerships today. Well, if you go to Europe, um, Lufthansa has been partnering with Deutsche Bahn for decades now, Air France with SNCF. Um, so these relationships already exist. They've been there, they've been successful. That's why they're continuing. And then when, the, uh, when France made the law of banning these short regional flights where there is a high-speed rail network, um, it, was an easily, it, was, it was an easy move for the airlines um, because they already had this relationship in place. But under the radar that most people don't realize is in 2021, something else happened. And that was the American carriers also joined this bandwagon. So it is possible to book a ticket on Deutsche Bahn uh, when you go to United.com or Talis uh, on Delta or anywhere also Deutsche Bahn or SNCF. Um, with American Airlines. So these major carriers already have these partnerships with high-speed rail. So to answer the question of would airlines have an incentive to partner with a high-speed rail uh, company? 
absolutely, it already exists. So let's dive into the more pressing issues that are facing the industry. And if you and just pick up the news, you'll see something uh, with the airline industry, you see the looming pilot shortage. In fact, this is such a huge industry that SkyWest that operates uh, airline flights for United, Alaska, and Delta, they saw their stock just last month crater over, decreased by over 22% when it was mentioned in their uh, first quarter call that they've run out of pilots. Um, so it is shaking the industry to its core. The reason this is a huge, huge issue was, first of all, you have all the, this mass retirement of pilots that started off in the military with the Vietnam War. But also what's happened in 2013, there was new regulations that came out. Prior to 2013, the regulations was you could have 250 hours of flight hours and be hired by the airlines. But it changed then to where you need 1,500 hours. That's equivalent of flying two to five years as a pilot before you build up those 1,500 hours. So literally the spigot of, for pilots has been cut off for the airlines. And United, for example, JetBlue have all started their own academies to bring these, to, to train these pilots, to get them up to the 1,500 hours. Uh, but that's where it's really struggle for the airline industry. Of course, if we build a high-speed uh, rail system, we take away those flights, those pilots that today are flying Minneapolis to Chicago can now be utilized for Chicago, Shanghai, which is much more profitable for the airlines. Or on top of it, the airlines can even expand their market without needing to even fly an airplane. Um, so there's 29 cities that SkyWest said they're ending to. I think I saw something like 17 cities by American Airlines. Uh, United was like a 22. Um, they can still maintain those vital services um, even in this looming pilot shortage. Um, but then let's get to the fun one, which is sustainability and the flight shaming that's taken place in Europe. Well, um, if you don't think C airline CEOs are worried about this, just look through their annual reports, their 10, uh, the 10K forms. Um, I pulled up all four here for the four major airlines, and we have everything from United Airlines saying that they're worried about costs due to changes uh, and liability to climate change to Delta Airlines talking about uh, the worry that they're going to start buying carbon offset credits and the effect on their bottom line. Um, American Airlines is worried about changing consumer preferences, which is actually occurring. When you start seeing, if you go to uh, Google Flights, for example, they, they post the, uh, the carbon uh, footprint that each flight would take. Uh, so they're worried about that. Even Southwest Airlines is worrying about their change in competitive position due to the sustainability and flight shaming catching on more here in the United States. So the CEOs of these airlines are very worried. Um, their solution so far has been um, sustainable aviation fuel, which is great. Uh, it's a very good start, um, but two major problems wrong with that. First, it's still adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, and second, uh, it's the problem is it's still, there's a limited amount of the sustainable energy fuel, fuel is, is grown. It's not mined from the earth or with, with drilling, but rather it's grown and then converted into aviation fuel. That means there's a limited capacity for the growth in farms, but on top of it, the oil industry is competing with other forms of transportation for that same sustainable fuel. Um, so I think I read a report that the most that the airline industry by 2050 will be able to attain is like perhaps 10 to 15 percent of its aviation fuel supply through sustainable aviation fuels. So the airline industry has kind of a band-aid right now, but they still need a long-term solution. And what could be better than a high-speed rail system powered by a renewal, renewable energy systems um, that they could integrate into the network to give them a positive image of being more green and sustainable. In fact, if we go back to Europe, um, this is kind of crazy. If you go to KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines, their website, they literally tell you, don't buy tickets on us for these short flights. Use a train instead. Uh, just blew my mind when I first saw that. Uh, it's like, wow, an airline. Um, so they have the, the, the partnership with Talus where you can still buy a ticket on KLM, uh, but you'll go by train. Um, as part of being uh, instructor and leading these groups up in Madison, of course, we had to look at when, when the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative uh, report came out, we had to look at what would be the effect on flights between if a theoretical Minneapolis to Chicago high-speed rail route was built? 
and uh, pretty incredible. We've been looking at, I think it took us on October 21st, 2021, a snapshot of all the flights that occurred that day. And we'd be looking at 139 flights that would no, not have taken place at a high-speed rail. Now that's not just 139 flights, that is close to 300 pilots that wouldn't have been needed. Um, and then more importantly, uh, 294 metric tons of CO2 were produced that day. Had a high-speed rail system powered by renewable energy existed, 294 metric tons per day would have been eliminated um, from, from the atmosphere. Um, so it's a really, really powerful and really eye-opening for us because this also doesn't take into consideration passengers who might not be along the line, say Oshkosh or Wausau, who might actually drive down to the closest intermodal center in order to get on that high-speed rail trunk line to O'Hare rather than looking for a flight out or um, from, from those local airports. So very, very, it was an incredible look at what the future could hold um, if we build these high-speed rail systems. And then even going to the airport, uh, pulling up some statistics here from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. And when you look at aircraft movements uh, at the airport, and anybody who's ever sat in the penalty box at O'Hare knows exactly what I'm talking about, you see nothing but uh, these regional flights everywhere. They take up gate space, they take up runway space, um, and even um, the case that they're not profitable necessarily for the airlines or the airports. But over 45% of the flights at O'Hare are these small regional jets under 75 seats. How, what would that look like if there was, we looked at the Chicago hub system being built with high-speed rail? How many of these flights could be easily taken out of O'Hare? And that begs the question, if there was a high-speed rail system seamlessly linked up uh, to, at O'Hare Airport with the O'Hare modernization plan, uh, that was, I believe, an $8 billion plan, have needed to take place. Um, so pretty incredible stuff when you look at the future of what high-speed rail could do for the airports and the airline industry. So that brings us up to the future. Where would this all go? Well, first of all, let's talk about why high-speed rail needs the airline. As I mentioned before, when you talk about airline alliances, it provides global connections. Um, when you build high-speed rail, you're talking about high fixed costs. There's, we're talking hundreds, in the case of Cal California, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars to build it out. Um, so once it's built though, one passenger moving through the system is just a very, very small incremental cost. So you wanna move as many passengers through that system as possible. Now, most reports, feasibility studies, when you look at it, uh, they, they talk about, okay, we expect this many passengers to go from Minneapolis to Chicago. But what they miss is how many passengers will go from Minneapolis to Chicago to New York or, or down to Orlando. Um, by collecting everybody in Minneapolis that wants to go somewhere and putting it down to, sending them on the train to Chicago, uh, Delta Airlines will allow that, United America would love it. Um, but we're looking at collecting everybody who wants to go anywhere in Minneapolis and sending them through this high-speed rail line. This means more people more demand for more trains and a much more efficient operation. So that's why these global connections to the airline industry are so po so powerful. Um, and the reason that high-speed rail would benefit if they had the route, the, the connection to the network of the airlines. Then of course, there's airline brand support. I mentioned loyalty programs, credit card programs, um, but more is just distinction. They'd be recognized by Every, everybody in the United States knows who United Airlines or Delta or, or uh, um, Amer American or even some British Airways. They know, they recognize the brands, they're comfortable with them. Um, they, it'll help overcome a lot of maybe a bad experience they've had on passenger rail in the past. Um, then it's so very, very pop powerful when it comes to brand support. Um, my expectation is because an airline's partnering with them, you would see less political opposition. You know, uh, what I was thinking about when I started this project, I was embroiled in bringing 125 mile per hour trains to Madison. It became the political platform for Governor Walker to get elected. Why is it a political platform? It's because most people don't recognize, even most Americans have not experienced what this incredible technology is like. Uh, all they hear is the amount of money has been spent and the delays. Um, so politicians pick up on that. But if you compare the, the political arguments with bringing high-speed rail to Madison, as opposed to something such as the O'Hare modernization plan, you see much different political opposition. That's why with an airline being on board, um, more of America will recognize what 
the brain, what the high speed rail network could do for them. And hopefully in the end, we're talking about less uh, being outside of politics as we build out these networks. And there is also the issue, uh, the case of business networks and knowledge base. Um, one of the things that fascinated me with my experience with Japan Central Railways is how they say they look at themselves more comparable to an airline than say Amtrak. Uh, if you've had experience on the Shikansen, you were talking about an incredible emphasis on safety, reliability, and being on time. When you compare that, what do what, when you look at airline uh, advertisements, what do you also see? on time, reliable, and, and, uh, and it's assumed safe. Um, so that's why we don't have much knowledge with high-speed rail here, um, but the airline industry with the travel networks have the overall experience and knowledge and connections um, that would, that would uh, just benefit the high-speed rail system. And this all leads to the most important function, which is you have everything else together. You have this, um, the airlines working with high-speed rail, and the, the money will then flow. They'll have the reputation with the capital markets um, so that Wall Street will be willing to make investments. Private and large um, funds will be willing to invest in high-speed rail. Um, so that raises the capital to help build out more of the system. Um, so that's where I see the benefit of why high-speed rail needs airlines. Now, what would it look like? Uh, well, first level I call code share partnerships. This is already being done. We saw this with United and Amtrak or United American Delta with the, the uh, European high-speed rails. So that's, that's a done deal. Uh, the next level we'll see is uh, some sort of joint venture. We kind of saw this, if you go back to Brightline and Virgin Trains USA, uh, that was kind of a joint venture where they were trying to, I believe they were trying to line uh, Virgin Atlantic Airlines, but it was trying to bring the whole brand together. And if you're not familiar with the joint venture, this is just where from a strategic standpoint, both companies get together and decide on what is the optimal operation um, for either those airplanes or those trains. Uh, so that'll very, very likely come soon, as I mentioned. I wouldn't be surprised if we see this with Brightline out of Orlando uh, in the next year or two. Then there's equity investment. Uh, this is likely where you see once high-speed rail is, is operating and growing, you will actually see where airlines are making investments directly into high-speed rail companies. So they essentially could be have a, a a seat at the table, uh, maybe a board member. Delta does this with their with their partners, for example, in Virgin Atlantic or Latam Airlines. Uh, they actually bought in so they could see be part of the strategy plan for the overall corporation. So this is a little bit farther down the line, um, but you know when we look, go back to the Texas example, after Southwest after the Texas TGV, there was a Texas High Speed Rail Corporation, American Airlines, and Continental. Uh, that's the one thing we all focused on Southwest Airlines, American Continental. They were actually part of the planning process for that corporation and even had plans to invest in Texas High Speed Rail Corporation. Um, so that's where we're likely to see this happen as we build out high speed rail here in the United States. And that leads to the final, which is outright ownership. Um, examples I have here is how Delta owns Envoy, uh, sorry, Delta owns Endeavor Airlines in order to uh, maintain control of. Their regional flights. American does this with, with the airline Envoy that I mentioned. Um, and that's a outright buying. Or if High Speed Rail was extremely successful, you never know. You could actually see perhaps High Speed Rail Corporation buying an airline. Uh, but that would be the last step where you see a fully integrated transportation network that seamlessly combines air and rail. Um, so, you know, this begs the question of where? It's, this, this all sounds great, but where would we see this? Well, so I mapped out. The headquarters of United in blue, Delta uh, hubs, not headquarters, hubs for United Airlines. Purple is Delta, red is American, and green is Alaska Airlines. And what's kind of fun about this is when you take this map of hubs and you start looking at what their Federal Railway Administration came out with their vision of high-speed rail corridors, you can see how the hub system uh, aligns perfectly with the vision of what high-speed rail in the United States could look like someday. So that got me excited. The difference is we got to put less emphasis on actually serving the city center and get all the plans out to serving the airports where there's a major airline hub. Um, so being, a, you know, being working with students, you have to look to the future. So one of the things we actually did was actually look to the concept of, all right, we're talking about this relationship. What would the airport at 2050 look like? Where would you put the high-speed rail station that's seamlessly integrated into the airport? Well, 
of course, we turn to Chicago, and we always anybody if you travel through, you might have always asked yourself, where's Terminal Four? Um, so we decided we're gonna we've designed based upon study master plans we've seen, and we came up with the concept. This is again just up in Madison with our group of the integrated Terminal Four, where actually uh, it's everything's on security, the the, the air side where seamlessly you come in on your flight from Los Angeles, you just walk to the other side of the concourse and you board your train to St. Louis, Minneapolis, or Milwaukee. Um, and it's all on the west side with also intermodal connections to the Algenor Expressway. So uh, we, we just thought that was fun. We actually entered it with a little competition here, but that's a, well, everybody up in Madison, uh, all us Badgers, uh, we call our concept of the inter integrated terminal four. So actually, just to recap, again, thank you all for listening, but um, the important thing to look at is airlines and airports are transportation networks. They're not just operators of aircraft. They are true networks. They have multimodal partnerships, global reach, and they're familiar to Americans. And as I mentioned, they're marketing monoliths. We talk about their potential to help get, recognize the high-speed rail as a valid, valid form of transportation, so powerful. On the flip side, what does high-speed rail have to offer the airlines? Well, as I mentioned, they have a huge problem with sustainability. They don't have a true solution, but the high-speed rail could be the solution to their CO2 emission problems. It would also be a solution to their pilot shortage. On the flip side, there's the cost. Uh, airline that partners with high-speed rail for these short regional flights, um, according to a study we did in, in 2014, we estimate that we would cut the airline's cost by 20 to 15%. Because uh, like I said, those short flights are expensive for the airlines. Um, so so uh, it would turn, it would affect their bottom line. And then of course, it's faster. Uh, rather than spending those two hours, 20 minutes getting from Madison to Chicago, we'd be looking at less than an hour, um, which makes the customer experience so much better. So again, bringing it back to where we all started with those airline seats, the tail of two seats. Uh, I asked you, are they really separate or are they combined? And um, I hope I leave you with the thought that when it comes down to it, it's all about the journey. And one seat that takes you to the next seat is really where we want to get in the future. So uh, again, thank you for all your time. Thank you, for Rich, Rick and Chris, for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I believe we've moved to uh, talking about some, some questions for, uh, from the, for some questions that are posed from the audience there. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, uh, Chris, are there any questions uh, at hand? Yes, uh, we have a few. And, uh, and, and thank you for me too, Mike. Um, your, your talk uh, definitely sparked lively discussion in the chat. And since you probably <laughs> couldn't keep up with it while you were talking, I thought I should share this compliment from a member of our audience named Joel, um, who said, excellent presentation, animated presenter, packed with good info, slides, <laughs> slides are appropriately supplemental, clearly articulated thesis. Wonderful job. <laughs> great, great, great. And I do see 84, it went up to 88 uh, chats. So yeah, I rely on you for that, Chris. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've got about 100 people uh, in the uh, audience are almost 100. Um, but uh, we, we let's see, we've had a number of comments and questions about essentially whether airlines and trains should compete or complement each other. And, and I know you spoke to that in, uh, you know, through the course of your talk, but one member of the audience asked uh, the question, I guess, in a, in a different way. Um, and that was, why would we design rail lines to enhance airlines and help to augment the emissions from that sector? Uh, is, is that something that uh, that you have any thoughts on or would like yeah, to respond well, to? No, no, definitely, definitely. Well, as we go back to what I showed the mission of a flight, um, the problem is when it talks to emissions, we're, we're never going to solve the problem with space technology um, because electric airplanes are not in the foreseeable future. Even when we talk about hydrogen airplanes, for example, Airbus is working on that, uh, but we're still talking about 30 years till that becomes a viable solution. So it's um, until then, we're still going to need to get a huge amount of passengers from Chicago to LA, Chicago to San Francisco, Chicago to New York. And so there's no real solution for those to be uh, that impact there. But where we can make a huge impact is on these short flights where we do emit the airplanes aren't as efficient and are to produce even more CO2 emissions before. So there is no easy answer. Um, I, we're just kind of looking at one little piece of it. But if we can, uh, for example, like I said in my one diagram, we're talking about 25 flights a day between Milwaukee and Chicago. It's really sad 
is Amtrak's Hiawatha does have a stop at Milwaukee Airport. Um, so it, it, it could actually be a short-term fix, but there's no, there's uh, no quick, easy answer um, for, for all the airlines' um, woes when it comes to climate, for CO2 emissions. Um, but here's a little, we have this, little, this large chunk that we could address. Okay, great. Um, and you, uh, you spoke in, in your talk about the ways that uh, this could be mutually beneficial uh, to the airlines and, and, and to, uh, to train operators. And, and you, know, you give some specific examples of how that kind of handoff is happening in, in some other countries. Um, but we had, we had one question, um, which was specific to the United States. And that's, is buy-in from the airlines especially important in the United States because we don't yet have high-speed rail? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Very good question. I, by buying with United with the airlines, what I would actually see is it makes high speed rail more. Um, uh, it, it gives it makes it real to Americans. I guess is the way to put it. Um, that by United or American or Delta putting their name behind it. Um, that'll actually tell Americans this is real. It is really going to happen. It is not going to be some political. Um, boondoggle or a pork barrel project, that it really will happen. And I think it'll actually, in the eyes of the consumer, it'll go, okay, this is real. We really do bring it here. Because uh, actually, especially when you look at demographics uh, between the different ages, the baby born generation did not travel as much as the Generation Zs and the, the millennials have. But the Generation Zs and millennials, I love working with them at the university because almost like a rite of passage prior to COVID, um, they did an international trip. And where I would always talk to a student is, have you been outside the country? And they'd go, well, yeah, I've been to Europe, went to Germany. Did you ride the trains? And you see them light up. Uh, their eyes are like, yes, why don't we have them here? Um, and that's why with the airlines kind of giving their seal of approval by partnering, I think we get the rest of the population of America to say, oh, this is real. This is real. This, is, this could actually happen. Okay, thank you. And uh, here's a, another question about um, uh, just sort of how this uh, this this could work. Uh, and the, the question is, uh, is there a reason not to shoot for long distance sleepers uh, at, at Chinese high speed rail speeds? For instance, LA to Chicago could be a 10 hour overnight trip. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, what I said, first of all, there's always a market for that, especially when you look at um, the popularity of the California Zephyr or um, the Empire Builders. So there's always a market for that. But um, the problem is, I always laugh at um, anybody who's driven to Denver knows there is a lot, a lot of empty space uh, between the cities. And unlike an airplane where the atmosphere is free for what they fly in, it's, we're talking to estimates about 25 billion to $100 billion, uh, not, sorry, not billion, 25 million to $100 million per mile. That is going to be very expensive linking going through Nebraska or Kansas or uh, parts of uh, New Mexico. So there's expense of that. Um, if, the, if the rails were built, you know, say you start building out high-speed rail from New York, uh, then Chicago, and eventually the networks connect uh, and it's a continuous high-speed rail system. Absolutely, I could see a sleeper on those routes, but it comes down to the infrastructure costs of building it. And is there enough revenue from this and demand for sleeper services uh, to offset that very, very expensive um, infrastructure costs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's another question related to those infrastructure costs. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the challenges facing the, or involved in, in building or expanding high-speed rail in the United States uh, regarding acquiring rights of, rights of way? Um, and the, the, the person who asked that question points out the, the hurdles that this is presented in, in places like Texas. <laughs> that's, uh, I, I think that's the, the billion dollar question we're all asking. Uh, we've been watching closely with, with what's going on in Texas. Um, I, first of all, I take the perspective of what's amazing about it is how the United States has changed. I love when you go back to the history of the Transcontinental Railroad being built and how it linked the whole nation. Um, the, the rails, the railroads, Union Pacific, and uh, uh, was not actually paid in future uh, grants. They were actually paid in land. And it's kind of funny that that's how it all developed, where today we, we fight with them in a domain route, when in fact, 100 years ago, um, the land was used as payment. Um, the reason I say that is 
there's always going to be the issue. The courts have to work out the eminent domain. I mean, as high speed rail, we're all rooting for Texas Central. But um, that's why you've seen strategies that I'm really excited, like Brightline West, where they're just following the interstate between LA and Vegas, where um, they know that there's only one landowner, then it's a, the, the DOT, um, so they it, it easily build it. Um, but I don't know the example. Uh, we'll closely see in 2021 what happens with Texas, and that'll determine the strategy. Uh, but the reason I go back to the Transcontinental Railroad is what's amazing about high-speed rail systems, they especially saw this in France in the building of the TGV, is once you build these high-speed rail routes, land values around the station go through the roof. Um, so that's where you have the real estate investors that get interested in high-speed rail. And perhaps someday they could help. Uh, once you get your fir the first high-speed rail system built in, true dedicated high-speed rail system, here in the States, um, I think the Wall Street incentive will help offset some of the political uh, landowner competition, the uh, landowner debates that are going on. But yeah, to bring it back, um, if anybody had a, that answer, I think Texas Central would really like to know right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, here's another question. Um, uh, it seems this, or it starts with a comment, I guess, uh, it, it seems this plan will put regional airlines out of business and that loses a lot of prestige for some small cities which only have regional airlines uh, and, and currently at least no passenger railroad service. Um, how do you think small cities could deal with that? Well, um, th there is a prestige about having airline service, but on the flip side is such cities as Wausau, Wisconsin, College Station, they've lost their air service. So uh, it's kind of a case of like, yes, it's nice to have airline service. And, and the fact is also, this is what goes back to the power of branding um, because having United Airlines fly or Delta fly to their city is very prestigious. Um, but when it goes back to the pilot shortage, these cities are at risk of losing all their airline service. Um, so that's, if this is everything for the city to have incentive is to keep the transportation networks because um, if they lose it, they're going to be more isolated than they are even today. So, uh, um, but also there's a fact of, as it, with a high-speed rail system, you might actually see a city. One of the one thing, cities I love is Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It's about, if you're not familiar with it, it's about, uh, today, about a uh, 90-minute drive outside of Minneapolis. Um, I would love to see that city. If you put, put that on the high-speed rail trunk line, you're going to, it's a small city, I think about 60,000 today. It could easily be a city of 200, 300,000, where airlines are clamoring to fly because of their linkages, uh, close linkages uh, to Minneapolis and Chicago. So it's very complex. There's, there's a lot of different reasons, but I would actually point to the pilot shortage of the risk of airlines lose, of cities losing airline service today um, rather than potentially more airline service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about, uh, I don't know if the work that you've done has looked at this uh, consumer uh, angle on this, but uh, the, this question is, does the size of a passenger seat have any impact on which mode of transportation a traveler selects? I would, um, that's, that's an interesting question because airline seats continue to get smaller and smaller, but uh, you know, the, the way I look at it is we see Americans buying SUVs versus buying um, small little compacts. So I would say it does have an impact. And, um, and that goes back to the, air, the rail, the comfort of the rail, where it's not only just faster, it is extraordinarily comfortable. Um, you, there's no, you don't even need to be all locked in for takeoff and landing. Um, so I would, I would actually say nothing, no research I have come across has actually done a study on uh, the potential uh, consumer choice based upon airline, uh, a passenger seat. Um, but it is out there. I would say you could just look around. Okay. Um, how about, um, how can airlines aid in funding acquisition uh, for high-speed rail? I, I, I assume we're acquisition, we're probably talking about land or, um, um, I'll, I'll take land, uh, eminent domain land, I can't really see, um, where they could aid the high-speed rail operator in, you know, say purchasing equipment and setting up operations and building stations is just by the airlines partnering, giving their brand approval to a high-speed rail line, 
um, that sends a message to the capital markets in Wall Street that they're that this is a real company that they're going to be something. So Wall Street will actually be willing to fund. It might be the case of just lower interest rates because Wall Street sees high-speed rail companies as less risky. Um, so it's kind of an indirect, but actually, and that by investment, um, it means the high-speed rail could lease more equipment or buy more equipment, hire personnel, or even uh, develop more sophisticated stations. Okay, thanks. And um, uh, how about, you know, going back to the, uh, the, the vision for Terminal 4 at O'Hare <laughs> that you shared, um, do you, have, have you and, and the group uh, done any, uh, looked at the, the costs of that and, and how that could get covered? No, uh, specifically where it all started from, well, there's, there's we, we, we haven't gone down to that level yet um, because there's multiple sources. I mean, one of the examples is, is if there was another form of the Build Back Better plan. Uh, could that be there? But um, that is, like I said, that is 40 years, 30 years down the road. Um, so we haven't got into the, the finances yet. One thing I forgot to point out with the concept is there's a Union Pacific rail yard on the Western side. That's where the idea started from. Uh, we would still leave Union Pacific alone, let them operate, but you can actually use it right away uh, to get easily in and out of Amer out of uh, O'Hare. That's, so that's where the idea, but yeah. We're still not at the point of cost estimating. In fact, O'Hara doesn't even know about this yet. <laughs> Actually, in the, uh, uh, what's it called? The official plan, the airport layout plan from uh, the last rebuild, yeah. right? So the runway rebuild, that has a high-speed rail terminal in that site. Um, and what they put, you know, if there was an, um, I'm being a little cynical. If there was an issue that was important enough to bubble up, but not important enough to really figure out how to do it, they would say, we'll put it in that terminal out there, the Western terminal. So High Speed Rail made it into that official plan. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't come across, I did, I, in, in the original version back, I think in like 2006, I saw something about the terminal, the Western terminal. Uh, but I did not see the the uh, high speed rail being part of that. So that well, what can I say? Like, we'll start with great minds think alike. We just have to figure out how to make it happen. <laughs> I see we're uh, a little past one o'clock, uh, and we have two more questions, as far as I know. Um, so if you're up for those, Mike, uh, I'll, I'll I'll give those to you right now. Um, the the first is uh, is just an invitation if you'd like to to comment on the high speed rail cost overruns in California. Uh, you touched on, you know, the politics of that uh, in, in your talk. I mean, is that something you'd care to say anything about or? Sure, sure. Um, well, what's fascinating about that is, um, first of all, you can talk, uh, I won't go into too much detail about my personal uh, thoughts about it because it's very little detail about where all the costs ended up. But when you look at how it's being, how it's the, where the, a lot of the costs offer, cost overruns a site in the news, um, such as, that the High Speed Rail Authority just hired vendors without even finishing the planning process of it, resulting in um, them starting to dig and come across utility lines and having to rebuild another tunnel. Um, that just kind of shows you where, um, first of all, the, the motivation was just jobs and higher jobs rather than actually building an efficient, productive system. Um, but on the flip side, this is where I look to our foreign uh, high-speed rail uh, partners out there. They know how to build high-speed rail. They've been doing it for decades. America, we've kind of lost this knowledge base. Um, so that's where I say if we were bring in a, as a consultant, such as Japan Central or SNCF, the, I probably, we probably see lower costs coming from California. Uh, now there's the other fact of, you could also argue legal and planning. I'm gonna stay out of that because um, that's not really my domain. Um, but the way I put it is there's a lot of experience outside the country. And I think with California, they try to use uh, individuals who are more familiar with highways or maybe even airports uh, to build what really is a new form of technology. Um, so that's where I look at it. It's, it's really, it comes down to the technical, both uh, building it and the management part about it. But with anything, I'm, I'm rooting for it. I, I wanna see it today, especially uh, California can build it. We can finally get it moving in the rest of the nation. 
But I, uh, in my view, the real key was the right of way. Yeah. And that's the part you have to be serious that you're really going to build it and then figure out how to acquire the right of way. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the lesson we need to take away from Kevin. And related to, uh, Mike, what you said about the expertise that other countries have, uh, this question is, um, does high-speed rail in places like Europe uh, and, and Asia work well because of larger government support for uh, infrastructure and, and, and things like that? For the most part, yeah. Well, absolutely, yes. I mean, when you look at the Spain case, where they built their first high-speed rail line in 1992, but then they saw, um, they used that, then the government got behind it. Uh, fully behind it, it and it's become the largest network in, in, uh, in Europe, absolutely. Because the problem is, but you can also make a case of how the US gets behind building and supporting airports. Um, the Ivory airport is owned by the government. So um, you do need, the way I look at it, if you were to ask me how, what I would look for is government funding for the rails, but private operators over the rails. Um, that's, I, we could also, I know we could all debate that, but that's really the model you see in the airline industry and it's been extremely successful here where you have the airports that are owned by the government, but private operators um, flying between the two. So you do need the government aboard, but also in my own research, the benefits to society out far, far outweigh uh, what would be a benefit to an investor. And we're talking about the development of future cities or revitalizing the Rust Belt. And so there is a government, uh, a greater good interest in building high-speed rail, but you definitely, definitely need the government support, and it definitely needs to be bipartisan. Um, it, 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 it just, I lost my hair over the fact that it's become so partisan. What can I say? <laughs> It sure has. Uh, well, here's, I'm going to, if it's okay, Mike, I'm going to sneak in one more question, which I think you'll like based on the little chat that we had before we got started. Um, would you tell us about the seat that you're sitting in? <laughs> that came from the audience. <laughs> Someone is wondering. Well, if you recall back at the beginning, I said the uh, uh, presentation I talked about, I'm what I call airline brat or grandma work for the airline, United Airlines, that mom did, I did. Um, so, you know, in some case, you run across as United is replacing their seats for the 777s with the new edition, you go, where do you put all these seats? So uh, I actually converted this into my office seat. It turns out it's actually very, very comfortable for about working for about eight to 10 hours. Uh, so uh, these are my airline seats. And of course I had to brand them with my, my Badger uh, UW uh, own, own little uh, take on these airline seats. But yeah, uh, it, it, these are A and B. Uh, so left side of a 777 somewhere that's hopefully still flying. Okay. Well, I think we'll have to wrap it up for the questions there. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, since you put in that conceptual drawing, I'll just share real quick um, two things. One is we've long thought that the quickest way to build a train station at O'Hare was uh, what we call Terminal 7, uh, which is would be up, up against a new parking garage that they just built. Um, and I went out there and was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that hard to get from here to the, uh, to the terminals. So this is one potential site in addition to the Western site. Um, we are also, uh, because this is what should happen, uh, we're in the process of creating a vision for a tunnel underneath the field where you just come up and um, you're underneath the main parking garage um, at the airport. So that's the way it should happen. And we should have started working on that back in 1955 when they were designing the original field. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Um, it was um, uh, very helpful. I, I really appreciate this, this presentation and uh, we look forward to talking again. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And uh, for those uh, who haven't yet, please go to highspeedrail.us, highspeedrail.us and hit that donate button. Uh, so we are supported by individuals who want to ride the train and clearly you're one of those people. Highspeedrail.us donate. So thank you very much for joining us today.